Hey, what's going on, everybody? This Talk is Radio. the edition of the Full Press Coverage Fantasy Football Podcast. We have some bit technical difficulties, but we should be good to go. Um, I will now soon be joined by Dean Williams once he hops on the line, um, once we get into that. Uh, so, basically, today we're going to be talking about the uh, – let me just call in and get Dean on here first before I – him in here and then we should be good to go because I hate technology and I suck at it, but we're going to go on. Okay. Let's see. I'm coming home. I don't know. This is such a pain. Seriously. I'm recording for like a fucking time. Dean, you there? I'm here. All right, perfect. All right, so we have everybody we need. Let's get this episode going before anything else goes wrong. So, all right. <laughs> so let's start off from the beginning. Um, so once again, this is the Full Press Coverage Fantasy Football Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about quarterback and tight end value sleepers, busts, and breakouts for the 2018 NFL season. Um, I am Andrew Erickson, your host at Andrew Erickson underscore on Twitter, and I am joined by Dean Williams. Dean, uh, say hi to the people. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. Exactly. He's good to be back. Um, This isn't like our second or third time trying to record this or anything, but uh, that's, you know, (laughs) a little bit past. Um, So anyway, we're going to be talking, you know, tight ends and running backs, or tight ends and running backs, yes. Quarterbacks and tight ends today, um, kind of a you know a little bit of a little, a little bit of everything. So, Dean, so I had you pick out your top values, sleepers, busts, and breakouts for the, those two positions before we got on today's show. So, why don't you go over your two value quarterbacks? Well, the two guys that I think have a lot of value, especially where they're being drafted at, are Philip Rivers and Matt Ryan. Both these guys are capable of the top 10 years, and I, I think Matt Ryan will be a top 10 quarterback this year. And Phillip Rivers, I don't think, will be far behind. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with that. Matt Ryan is going to return to the mean. You know, the Falcons offense was, you know, down a little bit all last year. You know, look across the board at all their players. You know, they were basically down all across the board. So, that was obviously unfortunate for them. You know, after 2016 when, you know, Matt Ryan was lighting it up in the Kyle Shanahan offense. So that obviously didn't work out in 2017, but I think that things are going to return to the mean in 2018 um, for the Falcons offense, especially where he's going. You know, he's going as quarterback 14, uh, Matt Ryan's a steal. And to think of Phillip Rivers. I know we were kind of talking off the show, but, you know, Rivers was one of two other quarterbacks, Russell Wilson and Tom Brady. Um, that played in 16 games and finished as a top 12 quarterback 11 times. So you have guys that are consistent, that have good upside, and have done it before. You know, they've been top quarterbacks before, so I do like them at their value, at their ADP. Um, For me, my values were Matthew Stafford. And uh, so with Matthew Stafford, the reason I like him is because I look at the – Matt Patricia in the defense over there and on the Lions. And I know that I'm a Patriots fan, so I've seen a Matt Patricia defense. And Matt Patricia's defenses are the bend but don't break defenses. So they give up a lot of yards, um, not so many points necessarily, but I think that the Lions defense is going to give up a lot of yards this year. And I think that's going to kind of affect the offense where they're going to have to play, they're going to have to throw the ball a lot. The Lions haven't necessarily shown great running ability in the past. I know they've made some improvements, um, but still until I see it, I still think they're going to be a pass-heavy offense. Still got Jim Bob Cooter as that offensive coordinator. 
And I think they're going to chuck it, you know, with the weapons that they have uh, across the board with Galladay, with Marvin Jones, and with um, Golden Tate. Uh, Dean, what do you think about Matthew Stafford? I like Matthew Stafford. I think Carryon Johnson could help bring some stability to that backfield uh, where they haven't had that in past years. But I still think they, you're right. They're going to have to throw because that defense is still a work in progress. And even when it's done, Patricia's defenses aren't the kind of attacking defenses that totally shut you down. They will bend but not break. I, I think Matthew Stafford's a great choice there. I think you could see him easily being a top-ten quarterback. Yeah, exactly. I think I honestly think Matthew Stafford could be in line to throw for 5,000 yards. If if they can't figure out the running game and they can't get that going, they're going to rely on the pass. He's a dome quarterback. He's done it before. And this kind of the 5,000 yards kind of gets me into my next uh, quarterback of value. So is Drew Brees. So Drew Brees. So with Drew Brees, people, so it's usually the name with him. And that's the problem I have. So Drew Brees right now is going as the quarterback seven. So usually Drew Brees is kind of up, you know, he's usually in the top five, usually most years, even like top three, um, you know, going last season. But last year he had a bit of a down year, um, statistically speaking. Um, You know, they were running the ball a little bit more. But I think that from the Saints offense, we're going to see an uptick with the passing game. Um, if you look at last year's compared to every other season with, in the Drew Brees era, they passed significantly less. It seemed more like an outlier year rather than like, okay, this is kind of like the new Drew Brees. Um, at least that, that's the way I right. see it. And you're already kind of seeing it right now. You know, they're already out. They're already out one of their top running backs from last year for, for the first four games. So they, they lost Mark Ingram. He got suspended. And then last year, you know, Willie Sneed was suspended for the beginning of the season. So they lost another pass catcher. So it made sense for them to, you know, shift to a more running style. Um, and it worked out that way. But I think that this year you're going to see them kind of shift a little bit back towards the passing game a little bit more. I mean, think about a Kamara, who's his biggest weapon is almost him in the passing game. Um, you have Michael Thomas on the outside. You have Cameron Meredith now, you know, as in Ted Ginn. They've drafted Jaquan Smith. Um, you know, a lot of pass catching guys, and then they're going to have Kamara Ingram after his, you know, suspension when he comes back, and we'll see how that kind of plays out. And then you got like, a bunch of Terrence West and Boston Scott and Trey Edmonds and a bunch of kind of no name guys, really, um, that are kind of filling out the backfield. And I, they've already said they don't want Kamara to be getting, you know, 15, 20 carries a game necessarily. So they're going to use him in the passing game. And I think that it can be simple as, you know, screen passes to Kamara. That's fantasy points for Drew Brees. Um, so I like Drew Brees. Value is tough for him. I didn't really know what other category to put him under than a value because I just think that he is someone that you don't want to necessarily be down on. And the consensus is down on him a little bit, but still a quarterback seven. He's still, you know, one of the more expensive quarterbacks. But I think that, um, and that's unfortunate just because due to his name, because people are like, oh, Drew Brees, he's good. Um, but I actually think that he actually will be right. good, not just based on his name. Right, I agree. Drew Brees in some places, like my fantasy league, is being drafted after Jimmy Garoppolo, which Garoppolo looked great, but only for a small period of time. He's going to have to do it longer than five games for me to take him ahead of Brees. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Drew Brees has been doing this for, like, what, five games? Drew Brees has been doing this for, like, 15 years. I'm going to go with the, yeah. uh, the slightly larger sample size there. Um, so, yeah, that's looking at our values at the quarterback position. Um, let's move on to the next section. So, your sleepers. So, your sleepers at quarterback, Dean, you had Alex Smith and Jameis Winston. So, I'm going to come at you. So, Alex Smith, Dean, how can Alex Smith be a sleeper? He was, like, what, the top, like, he was the top two quarterback last year, wasn't he? He was He was fourth. I mean, he was fourth. in the top five, and he should not be a sleeper at all, but he's being drafted after Blake Bortles. Oh, a lot God. Of and, and that's just no offense to Mr. Bortles because he does what they ask him to do. But I think Alex Smith is in line to have a great season in Washington. He has – all kinds of weapons. If if Reed can stay healthy, 
uh, there's not many guys I'll talk about that are as good as Travis Kelsey because Travis Kelsey is my number one tight end in fantasy, just edging out uh, Gronk a little bit this year. But Reed is one of those guys that are in that conversation if he's healthy. Uh, you put him together with Chris Thompson and Darius Geis, and you've got a good solid core there now. The wide receivers are a little bit uh, – Josh Doxson, it's always time for Josh Doxson to step up a little bit. And I think this may be the year he does. Yeah. That's, Josh my, hope. Doxson. That's my hope anyway. You never know, though. Yeah, Josh Doxson is just like – he's a guy that, you know, we're waiting to – you know, we're waiting for it to happen. And it, with Josh Doxson, too, and this kind of gets off – I know we're talking about, you know, specifically the quarterbacks. But, you know, Josh Doxson seems like more of a, you know, get up and, go, get up and catch it receiver. So he's not really like a receiver that, you know, necessarily wins by getting open as much. He's more of a receiver that kind of, you know, he um, – he goes up and gets the ball. So he doesn't necessarily create right. openings, you know, like Paul Richardson kind of is more or less likely or more likely to do or Jameson Crowder, those other weapons there. But yeah, it's crazy. Like Alex Smith, you know, some, I've heard some people say like from a, like a football standpoint, not maybe not a fantasy football standpoint, but from a football standpoint that Alex Smith is actually an upgrade over Kirk Cousins. And that's why they, you know, they made that initial move. And it is interesting because, mm-hmm. I don't really see the Reds. It's weird because, I mean, if you put them probably, like, in a vacuum, you'd probably say Kirk Cousins is better than Alex Smith. But then, like, when you think about their teams, like, I don't – I can't really say that the Redskins are, like, that – like, you don't really think that they're that much significantly worse as a team now they have Alex Smith. You kind of look at it and you're like, oh, it seems like that will probably fit maybe better than what Kirk Cousins was. Like, it's like Kirk Cousins and the Redskins just kind of had a – you know, a very, what's the word, just a, a relationship that didn't mesh. They just didn't really seem to, like, really get it together. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. it. They they had their shot to sign Cousins to a long-term deal, and I think the Redskins kind of waited. And then when the, it came around the next year, then Cousins was like, okay, you waited a year, so I'm going to wait a year. And it didn't work out. I guess there was a lot of animal. I, don't, I wasn't that close to the situation uh, but I guess there was some animosity between both sides there. Um, I, I don't see Alex Smith as a huge upgrade over Kirk Cousins, but I don't see him as a downgrade either. I think a lot of guys will play to their average. Uh, they might have one great year, and then they'll fall back towards their average. But when they do that, it's like they're just playing better the way they've always played. Alex Smith played differently last year. He suddenly discovered he can throw the ball downfield and his receivers are going to go get it and take care of the football. I think he'll continue to do that as long as his receivers, uh, the three you mentioned, Richardson and uh, Crowder and Doxson, of course, can can go get the football. I, I think he'll be successful in Washington too. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a good move for them. And, and you don't, can't, can't sleep on Alex Smith's uh, passing bill. It's just weird though. Like seeing Alex Smith, he's going as a quarterback 21 or like what I'm kind of seeing here. Like, uh, like, like you said, um, but still like going, you know, in drafts, you know, after Blake Bortles, it, it's crazy. Cause he, like he finished quarterback four and usually like it's the total opposite. Like usually these quarterbacks that finish super high, then go like super high. But Alex Smith just has that. So like the like plain ice cream mantra to him, just like, ice cream, no toppings, like, he's just so, like, bland that it doesn't matter. He could have, like, finished <laughs> as a quarterback one, and he would still be drafted as, like, quarterback 24. Like, like right. think of it as, it's crazy. Like, even Mahomes is going in front of him significantly, and just no love for Alex Smith. No no love for Alex Smith these days, but that's why you got him as a sleeper. So, I, I definitely like that pick. Um, and then you have Winston. So, what are your predictions kind of for Winston in, what is it, year four now, right? Year four, Winston's still pretty young, though. I think he's only 23, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So I think he's still learning the game. And I think with Winston, it's all about his maturity level. They they went out. Peyton Barber, I think, was a, a good back. But they went out and got uh, another running back in the draft that's going to be pretty good. They uh, His name just runs off. This escaped Ronald me right Jones. in a second. But I think, right, thank you. 
Um, and I think that he his development with the weapons he has, he's got Mike Evans, who I think is one of the best receivers in football, and he's got speed on the outside with Godwin and with uh, um, well, Jackson. Deshaun Jackson. Deshaun Jackson. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm a, <laughs> my brain's a beat behind on, on Jameis. Um, but I think he's he's uh, got all the physical tools. Once he gets his head on straight, which and I think he was hurt most of last year also. I think you'll see him take a take that next step forward this year, and he could be a top twelve quarterback. Yeah, no, I definitely think so. And and actually, you know, fun fact about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So they actually led if you combine Jameis Winston's passing yards with Ryan Fitzpatrick's passing yards for the whole season. That if that was one player, that player would have led the NFL in passing yards. So, you know, realistically, you can kind of you could have projected out. You know, if Winston had actually ended up playing all of his games. He could have led the NFL in passing yards, and it probably would have been close to almost 5,000 yards passing. So, I mean, Winston has that kind of gunslinger kind of he, – he has those games where he throws three picks, but also throw like five touchdowns. Um, he's not afraid to – I guess I should say he's not afraid just to throw it up. He rarely checks it down because I, I remember this one play with him. He's literally like about to get sacked, and the, I can see the coach on the sideline and just like, just get sacked. But Winston is like <laughs> – scrambling around, throws the ball up, and he, like, literally, like, does everything against the book. Like, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Um, and I think it ends up being a fumble. But then he – I remember another play where he did that. I think he was in his own end zone, and he just, like, juked out a bunch of guys, and he chucked it deep to your guy Mike Evans, like, 50 yards down the field. I was like, what? It's like, I mean, he's definitely got the talent. And I like Winston, too, um, as a, a guy you can get late. I mean – with these quarterbacks, it, you know, it's funny, you know, when I was looking for my value, it's almost like there are so many quarterbacks that are valuable. I, I don't remember it, it. I don't remember a quarterback ever being necessarily this deep. You, you, looking across the board, I mean, you can make an argument that almost every single team of all 32 NFL teams, you know, kind of talking real football here, but every team has kind of like a franchise quarterback kind of either playing or, or in, the way, in the wings kind of waiting. But quarterback mm-hmm. seems like pretty – like the most deep it's ever been. I would agree with that. There there are a lot of guys that are coming to the end of that franchise road, and there are a lot of guys that are right in the middle of it. And enough young talent has come in the last couple of years that it's an interesting situation at quarterback. You can wait late in your fantasy draft and get a guy that's going to put a good good points on the board for you each and every week. Yeah, no, exactly. It's why you got to weigh on quarterback. I know it gets and you get the trigger happening because you see you see Aaron Rodgers. You're like, oh, I gotta pick Aaron Rodgers. I gotta pick him. But you gotta like, nope, chill out. Don't be that guy unless obviously everyone does it. And then Aaron <laughs> Rodgers is available in like the ninth round. You're like, yeah, I'll, I'll take Aaron Rodgers. Yep, I'll take quarterback first. No, <laughs> yeah, that's that. I'm that guy. I'll be that guy. Uh, so. And then absolutely in the ninth round. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's bizarre. I mean, I can't. I mean, for me, I think with Aaron Rodgers, I would take him. I think the fifth round is kind of where I'll consider him. Obviously, mm-hmm. anywhere after that, I probably like locked in. But I think the fifth round is really where I'd be like, okay, like who else is available? I, I might consider it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Rodgers in the fifth round, you, you'd have to take a look at it, depending on who you had. Mm-hmm. Over there on your team, but he's he's that good that oh yeah yeah exactly. I'll be the first I mean, guy like you said I'll I'll take him. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll take him in the ninth round yeah no worries um cool <laughs> so let's move right along here so those were your sleepers uh, Alex Smith and Jameis Winston so my sleepers so I only have one I only picked one sleeper quarterback and it's a guy that everybody's down on it seems like is Dak Prescott. So everybody's talking about how the Cowboys don't have any receivers and Dak doesn't have any – Dak doesn't have Dez. But let's be honest. Dez sucked last year. He was <laughs> terrible. And honestly, I think that Dak will do better because Dez, Dez isn't there anymore. 
I'm like pretty blunt about this because, you know, I mean, I watched the, you know, the all or nothing on the Cowboys, you know, like everyone did. And I'm not sure if you've seen it, Dean, but Dez is a pain in the ass in that he's just a diva and he's complaining and he's like, give me the ball, blah, blah, blah. And like, they force him the ball a lot. I mean, if you look at his targets for that year, um, he led the team in targets and his cash percentage was reflective of how good he is at actually getting open and catching the ball. It's not good. And that honestly hurt Dak a lot because it'd be, you know, third and, you know, third and three, and they'd be like, all right, we got to, you know, fade to Dez. And he wouldn't catch touch. He wouldn't catch touchdown. He wouldn't catch, he wouldn't catch the pass. So I think that having, you know, receivers kind of not having a number one, it will actually help Dak a little bit more. He doesn't have to force the ball to one particular receiver. He can find the open guy, go through his reads, like do his thing, and he's gonna get Zeke back. Like, and he also has one of the best offensive lines in the league that's you know all intact again. So, I think it's just really, I think people are just too down on him, especially because of how good he's been in terms in fantasy. Um, I tweeted this out last night, kind of when I was looking at Dak with Zeke and Dak without Zeke. Um, and it also can also you can also kind of throw in the, the left tackle um, as well because obviously he missed time when um, Zeke missed time. But essentially, when you look at Zeke with Dak Prescott, so Dak Prescott with Zeke score averages 19.3 fantasy points per game. Without Zeke in the games, and this is his career numbers, not just last year. Um, without Zeke, he averages 11. Point seven two fantasy points per game. If you projected, so if Dak had played with Zeke all year last year and continued at that nineteen point three fantasy fantasy points per game pace, Dak Prescott would have finished as the number two quarterback overall last season behind Russell Wilson. So that's my argument for for Dak Prescott, um, and I also like he's mobile. People forget that. He's a mobile quarterback. He scores rushing touchdowns. That's super, um, you know, desirable in, in the fantasy world. You get those those extra points, obviously, depending on your league. But I think Dak is a really – is a sleeper. It's weird to say, say that, but, I mean, he's going as a quarterback 17. Like, I mean, people are taking Andrew Luck before Dak. Andrew Luck doesn't have a shoulder to you. So that that's my take on Dak. Dean, I don't know how you feel about Dak, but uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I think it will help Dak having Ezekiel Elliott there all year. It has to. You have to respect Elliott, or he will run all over your defense. You have to be prepared for that, and that will only help a mobile guy like Prescott, like you said. He will put some running touchdowns in uh, for Dallas this year. The thing that will, I think holds you back a little bit for me is the, is the fact that Witten finally retired. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how their tight end situation is in Dallas. I do think that's a little bit low if you've got him uh, going at, what, 16 or 17. That's a little low for him with Elliott playing the whole year. But I think it'll hurt with Witten being out a little bit. But as far as Des Bryant being gone, it, it could help him. I mean, it's hard probably for a younger quarterback, even though – uh, Prescott's obviously a leader to come into a huddle that Des Bryant's been in for a de- better part of a decade, and he's played at a high level and he's done all these wonderful things for the franchise. It's probably hard not to throw him the football sometimes, even when he doesn't need the football thrown to him. So I think you're right. I think it will help him uh, in the long run. Yeah, yeah. No, I like the point about Jason Witt, and that's definitely. Uh, yeah, that's not definitely not a win for Dak losing Witten, um, just because Witten was, you know, uh, you know his security blanket. But at the same time, Witten was getting older, and realistically, like, how much of a threat was he really in the passing game? Like, he would obviously move the chains, but I mean, you wouldn't ever think like you you were never expecting uh, Witten to be like, oh my God, Witten took over that game last like yesterday, like that 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 was <laughs> never gonna happen. But um, you know, you know, I would. I have another sleeper, you know, that could potentially be a Dallas Cowboys tight end, but we'll we'll get to that when we get to the tight end section. Uh, so a little sneak peek. So if those listening that are just going to, you know, only listen to half the show, you're going to stick, stick by for my Dallas Cowboys tight end sleeper. Yeah, it's huge. It's going to be big. Um, 
All right, so moving right there. So let's. So we got over values. So just a quick recap: um, Matt Ryan, Philip Rivers, Matthew Stafford, Drew Brees are our value quarterbacks. Our sleepers so far: Alex Smith, Jameis Winston, and Dak Prescott. Um, so these are guys you guys want to be targeting in your guys' drafts, whether you're playing best ball. Um, obviously, you know I'm doing best ball leagues because I'm I literally am obsessed with this stuff and. It's just like I can't get enough drafting. Um, but let's look at now busts. So your busts, Dean, for the quarterback position are Jimmy Garoppolo and Mitchell Trubisky. So why are you hating on Jimmy G? <laughs> it's not that I don't like Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> I think he's going to be a top-flight quarterback. But I just don't know if it's going to be this year. Um they moved the ball well. They won a lot of football games, but they did not put it in the end zone a whole lot last year with uh, Garoppolo at the controls. I, I don't uh, – they're going to have to put the ball in the end zone to win out out west. It's uh, it's not that I, I don't like him, but it's uh, – the defense has got to be able to control the football a little bit, I think. And uh, he's just got to prove it a bigger sample size, like we talked earlier, is going to have to be available for me to look at. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, you want to love him. I mean, you just look at him and you're like, ah, oh, he's got to be a top five quarterback. He just looks like one. Um, he's just so handsome, but yeah, I, I, I agree that the hype has kind of outdone it a little bit and then he wasn't that great. I, I know that he did though. He was really good against the Jaguars last year. So that's like a game that really stands out. And he also threw for, I believe, around almost – he averaged close to 300 yards a game. Um, so whereas, yes, his touchdowns weren't that high, that touchdowns are sometimes pretty, you know, fickle in terms of, you know, how often they happen, whereas yards are more consistent. So he did throw for – I mean, he was almost on pace, I think, for like 5,000 – 5,000 yards, but, like, with, like, 20 touchdowns or something mm-hmm. like that. So, they didn't really add up. So, I can see the touchdowns going up, yards going down. But, yeah, I think that there's still a lot to be proven with him. Um, there could be more film on him. That could kind of, you know, and the thing is his, his, um, his draft capital is pretty high. I mean, it's quarterback, I'm looking at one that says quarterback nine. Um, so, yeah. it's definitely higher. I mean, it's going as a top 10 guy. I mean, I'm taking Matt Ryan, Phil Rivers. I'm taking those guys all over Jimmy Garoppolo later. That's, that's for sure. And, and the one thing that people don't really talk about is like, so well, who's he going to throw the ball to? I mean, he's got some decent weapons, but he doesn't really have like a, a stud guy really. I mean, he's got Garcon, Marquise Goodwin, I'm um, George Kittle, one of my tight ends uh, that I'm going to talk about later. Um, George Kittle, who I do like, but I'm not necessarily a guy that's going to carry the load for the 49ers offense. But, yeah, I definitely could buy into Jimmy Garoppolo being a bust in 2018. Mitchell Trubisky, though. So, the thing with him, that's what I'll ask you first before you kind of talk about him. So, he's going pretty late, so – does he still qualify as a bust if you take him as, like, I can't imagine you'll get him as a quarterback one. I feel like he's got to be, like, a quarterback two. Well, that's a good point. He's not anywhere near uh, going to cost you the draft capital that a Garoppolo would cost you. Uh, the thing about Trubisky, he threw seven touchdowns last year in 12 games, and he threw seven interceptions in 12 games. And I hear um, – about how much better this Bears offense is going to be. And it has a chance to be better. I've got a new coaching staff uh, and some nice pieces. I, Allen Robinson, I think, is fantastic. I wish that guy could stay healthy because I'm an Allen Robinson fan when he's on the field. So we'll see how he does. But he just didn't – they didn't give him a whole lot to work with last year as far as the playbook. And so um, he's going to have to – get in the playbook, open it up, and he's going to have to make those decisions on the fly uh, before I buy into Mitchell Trubisky being uh, being one of the better quarterbacks or one of the better young quarterbacks in the league. Yeah, Mitchell Trubisky, the the thing that I remember him about him the most is so the NFL Instagram account will do, you know, like top plays from this quarterback or, or whatever, and Mitchell Trubisky 
all of his top plays from 2017 were all running plays. <laughs> plays that he actually didn't throw the ball in. So, <laughs> so just, just keep in mind, you know, maybe Mitch Trubisky is making more plays with his legs. It's totally possible. Um, but, yeah, I think that Mitchell Trubisky, people are just buying the hype. He's surrounded by weapons. Um, but sometimes these take – this takes a year for it to, like, really mesh. You know, you add all these guys. Like, you can't just assume he's automatically going to have chemistry. He's automatically going to absorb the offense. Like you said, you know, he's going to dive into the playbook. So, I think it might be a year out, which makes better sense, though, because that way, you know, Mitch Trubisky, if he doesn't have that breakout year this year, he'll, you know – fall out of favor next season, and then next season you buy him low. So next season, Dean, when we do this, Mitchell Trubisky will be on the value section and not the bust section. It's very possible. It's very possible. So my bust at the quarterback position are Andrew Luck and Jared Goff. So Andrew Luck, I'll keep it brief, it's the shoulder thing that's really concerning for me and we talked about it earlier quarterback is so deep that why even like take the risk like is his upside really like 40 plus touchdowns again like are we ever going to see that Andrew Luck again I'm just concerned that he'll never even if he does come back and plays and I've read some things that um, I've retweeted a couple things that he's you know he's seen special doctors and someone that I know that knows someone that works for the Colts you know, as a Colts doctor said that there's a chance he might retire. So, I mean, someone his age talking about retirement, like as a real possibility, is just very concerning for me. And I just, I don't, I can't buy into the risk. And even though he's going later, I mean, he's still quarterback 16. Like I'd rather just take a quarterback that has an arm that I know is going to work. And there's a lot of question marks. And I'm just concerned about how fast he'll start this year. I mean, if they do, if he doesn't play the whole preseason, and he goes week one his re, his first real game action since like 2016, like uh, January of 2016, whenever the last time he or January of 2017. Actually, I don't even remember the last time he played. Um, but luck, yeah, luck kind of scares me off, and I I just don't see the upside being there for him anymore. What do you think about – are you taking a look in, in drafts that you've done, Dean, mock drafts? Are you buying into luck? What are, you, what are your thoughts on luck? Well, I'm not I'm not buying into Andrew Luck either for a lot of the reasons you said. It, that shoulder, um, it looks healthy on what video I've seen, but he hasn't got hit yet. And let's look at – remember who he's got to face. He faces the Jaguars twice, and that team is – defense is nobody's quarterback's friend. Uh, He faces the the Houston Texans twice. Uh, And if all those guys, J.J. Watt and Whitney Merciless, and those guys are healthy, they will bring heat to the quarterback too. And a much improved Tennessee Titans defense. It's not going to be – there's six games a year, then it's not going to be fun to be a quarterback uh, in Indianapolis. So I, I don't know. I hope Andrew Luck's healthy because I think the game's better when Andrew Luck's healthy and can play. But I'm not on the Andrew Luck hype train either. Uh, he's going to have to prove his durability. I mean, the guy plays hurt. There's no doubt he's tough because he plays hurt. But he's hurt. That's the only issue with Andrew Luck. Yeah, it's 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 it sucks for kind of everybody with Luck. But I just can't buy into him when I can just take <laughs> I can just take a quarterback that I know is going to you know have less risk involved and. I just I I don't think that you need luck. I don't think people are going to I, I look at like the bigger picture here and I don't think at the end of the year we're gonna say, Wow, like my fantasy team got like my fantasy team was so good because I had Andrew Luck. Like that usually doesn't happen with the only time that really happens with quarterbacks is like when those rookies like go off, like Deshaun Watson. Like mm-hmm. and that's a guy you get like even later than Luck is getting. Like, Sean Watson last year in drafts, I mean, I'm pretty sure for the most part he's probably going whether undrafted or as, like, a, a quarterback 20-plus. And then, obviously, he's, he, you know, he, he was a waiver wire pickup. Nobody was drafting Sean Watson in redraft leagues last year. He wasn't starting, so why would you draft him? So that's kind of what I see. It, and, and we obviously how, saw how good Sean Watson was. And he also probably would have been a bust for me, but I don't want to get into it because it's like, 
basically the consensus that there's no way he can possibly um, repeat what he did last year. And part of me just really wants him to, just because I just kind of want someone to like prove everybody wrong be like, yeah, well, Deshaun Watson, like his efficiency, like actually he actually did better somehow in the next year. I'd love for that to happen. I just think that'd be really funny just based on like everyone be like, no, he can't possibly do better. It's impossible. And I mean, I'm on, I agree with that. Like the mathematics show that there's really no reason why Deshaun Watson should be as good as he was last year. It doesn't really make any sense for that, but I'd like to see that. That that would be funny to see that happen. But my other guy, Jared Goff. So with Goff, he is strictly matchup based. And that's actually why I kind of liked him a little bit last year because you knew what games to start him and you knew what games to sit him. The thing with him, though, is his schedule's harder this year than last year. Obviously, the Rams finished in the last place last year, so their schedule was easier. This year, though, they finished in the first place, so they have a harder schedule. So I think Goff is just going to be someone that's a little less re- – he's not going to be reliable. He'll have his weeks um, against bad defenses, for the most part, and that's usually what he did last year. But I think that the Rams as a whole, the offense is going to kind of come back. I, I just don't see – I mean – can the Rams really be better than they were last year? I mean, they're the number one offense last year. Do we really think that they'll just be the off number one offense again? And if that's – is Jared Goff what we saw last year, the best Jared Goff? Like, is that kind of his fantasy ceiling? Um, it might be. Um, he's, not, he's not a dynamic runner like Wentz or Watson is. So, I'm not, I'm not in love with Goff as a guy. I mean, I'd take him as, like, a two, but I would, I would not feel comfortable if Goff was my, like – my weekly starter that I'm like, oh, I'm locked and loaded with golf. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with that. Jared Goff, his, the defense in LA got better. Um, they yep, signed too. two, they got, they got Peters. I think there'll be a lot of games where uh, he doesn't have to throw and he's just going to turn and hand it to Todd Gurley. I mean, that's a great option for anybody oh, yeah. um, to have to do. And uh, I don't know. Like you said, I think he may be pretty matchup based this year, and I don't think he's going to have to throw that much. Um, yeah, I don't have him in my top half this year as far as quarterbacks go. Mm. So, yeah, I agree with you. Cool. And then the next last part here, uh, breakouts. So, your breakout quarterback for 2018 is and was my quarterback breakout for 2017. Uh, Marcus Mariota. So let's hear about him. This is the first year I think that Mariota has not had to rehab an injury or get over an injury in the off season. He's been able to uh, study the offense, which is good because it's a new offense. Uh, there, there won't. Hopefully, I won't see any more uh, two receiver patterns like you used to see with with Tennessee last year and Terry Robisky's offense. I don't think you will. I think uh, Matt LaFleur is a dynamic guy. I think the short passing game will come to Nashville, and that's the kind of thing Mariota grew up with, went through Oregon with. He'll use his feet and his legs when he has to, and I think he'll have a great year. I like it. I like the the offensive coach move, or uh, the, the new head coach, Matt LaFleur. I think he's going to bring a lot of good things to the Titans offense. They've got the dual running backs. Um, I think big part of Mariota, too, is this Corey Davis just, you know, gets his stuff together and, and really proves that he's that number one receiver. Um, but, you know, a good cast around Mariota, so he should be able to be effective. It's just, And a lot of people are down on him, too. So Mariota's a breakout, but I think he's also a good value guy this year as well. I mean, he's going right around kind of where Jameis Winston is as quarterback, I'm looking quarterback 19. So, I mean, he's going, it looks like he's going after like Derek Carr. I mean, I would take, I'd take Mariota over Derek Carr, like nobody's business. That, that, that doesn't seem like a hard decision for me. Um, My breakout quarterback is, let me get that, Patrick Mahomes. So I like Mahomes. You know, based on, you know, kind of what we saw with the offense, I do think that his ADP is a little bit higher than I would anticipate. You know, he's going at the back end of the 12th, quarterback 13 ADP. Um, But he definitely has 
some serious upside with the Chiefs offense. They have a lot of weapons. They have, you know, Watkins, Hill, Travis Kelsey, Kareem Hunt. I mean, they had a, they have an offense basically that ascended Alex Smith to be a top five fantasy quarterback. Now, do I think Mahomes is going to be a top five fantasy quarterback? No. I think it's too much to put on the him to be like, oh, he's going to match exactly what Alex Smith did last year. I think that's not fair to him. But I still think that he has a massive upside with his kind of gunslinger mentality that he could potentially, you know, break out this season um, with all those weapons and definitely have some huge games um, there in Kansas City. Yeah, he's definitely got weapons. Um, There's a lot of reports out of Kansas City that he's already got an almost unnatural rapport with Sammy Watkins, which Sammy Watkins is another receiver that you're just waiting for him to explode and do fantastic things. The talent's there. Um, Of course, Ty Hill, he blew up last year. There's a lot of speed on the outside. That's part of the reason I think Travis Kelsey is going to have such a great year this year is because young quarterbacks tend to lean towards their tight ends, and there's so much speed on the outside. And with Kareem Hunt underneath, I think the middle will be wide open for Travis Kelsey this year. I think he may have a a record-setting year this year with Pat Mahomes at the controls. Like you said, is Mahomes the top five guy? Not this year. You know, maybe next year, year after, he he might be in that conversation. Um, But he's just going to get his feet wet. He's got kind of a gunslinger mentality, I think, and he's going to try to force the ball into some places that it doesn't need to be forced in, and he's going to throw some turnovers, I think, early. Uh, But I think he'll get it together. I really like Pat Mahomes as a quarterback. Awesome. Yeah. So quick question. So before, so that kind of wraps up at the quarterback section here. Um, before we get off quarterbacks, just a couple things I've kind of thought of. So in a dynasty league, Dean, would you rather have Marcus Mariota or Jameis Winston? The dynasty league, uh, Mariota. I think the organization's rather, better. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson? Ooh. I think I'm going to say Deshaun Watson. Um, as long as anybody throwing to DeAndre Hopkins, <laughs> that guy is un- unbelievable. And, and Will Fuller has proven he can play well in, with Watson at the control. So that's a close one, but I'm going to say Watson. Yeah, no, I agree. I actually had that trade offered to me. I had Mahomes. And somebody offered me Deshaun Watson straight up. Um, at first, I was like, I kind of like looked at it. I was like, wait, what? And I was like, and so what I, I did end up accepting the trade. And so I got Watson. And for me, what what kind of kind of did it for me was like, hey, I've seen Deshaun. I've already seen Deshaun Watson be dominant in the NFL. I haven't seen that mm-hmm. from Patrick Mahomes. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to go with something that's a little bit more known. And that's why, you know, that kind of helped me make the decision with this Watson. It's like, hey, I've seen it. I've already seen it. I've seen him be good in the NFL. So I'm going to go with, with something that I know um, as opposed to something I don't know. Um, and then the last one here for you, would you rather let's see? Da, 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 da. So or Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan or Phil Rivers, who, who do you have higher? I've got Matt Ryan higher. Um, okay. He's always been solid. I think. Um, I think he's got more in the tank than Philip Rivers might have at this point. Yep. Yeah, and you can make the argument too that Rivers lost Hunter Henry, and Matt Ryan hasn't really lost anybody. He's only gained. Now he has Calvin Ridley. You know, he still has his two running backs. So I think that Matt Ryan has probably. Uh, overall surrounding cast is probably a little bit better than the Chargers. I mean, they're both very good offenses. I think Matt Ryan has a slight better advantage, and also Matt Ryan plays in a dome. So, you know, just more passing yards. So I agree there. I think I would take Matt Ryan, but it is close. But, yeah, I think I'd take Matt Ryan over Phil Rivers there. Um, all right, so now we can move on to the best and most favorite position in fantasy football, the tight end. 
So we'll kind of reverse it here. So instead of starting with values, we'll start with breakouts, vice versa. So your breakout candidate for the tight end position, Dean, is from the hashtag dog pound, David Njoku from the U. Give me so Njoku. So how? Okay, my first thing with Njoku. So how is he going to catch targets with you know Landry and Gordon and uh, Chubb and Duke Johnson and uh, is there enough room to go around? I think as long as Tyrod Taylor is playing quarterback, there will be. If if uh, Baker Mayfield takes over at some point, then I don't know what Baker Mayfield will do, but. Young quarterbacks, again, tend to lean on tight ends more uh, because they've got that middle-of-the-field kind of availability where guys like to throw the football. Taylor has proven he will throw the ball to the tight end. Uh, Charles Clay, who is, uh, I think, comparable athletically uh, to Ninjoku, has played well and had really big games with uh, Tyrod Taylor as a quarterback. I think there will be enough to go around for – for him to be in the top uh, 12 conversation as far as tight ends go. Yeah, I like that take. Uh, I like Njoku. I have him in the Dynasty League. Um, I have I have a weird Dynasty team. I have David Njoku, Delaney Walker, and Kyle Rudolph all on the same team. So wow. I'm trying to move pieces, and I'm kind of like not really sure because I all kind of, they all have not like all similar value, but, you know, Walker – can obviously be used now. And Joku's kind of like a, bre- a breakout candidate. And then Rudolph's kind of in the middle. Rudolph's a, little bit, a lot younger than Walker is. I don't think, I think Rudolph's still, I think he's only like 28. Um, so he's kind of that more that mid range guy. So I don't know how I ended up with all of them. Just kind of worked out that way. <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> want to try to move one um, because I don't need three tight ends. But then again, you know, tight ends constantly get hurt all the time. So maybe it's not a bad thing that I have multiple ones that I can use and start. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I think the only concern with Njoku is just targets and just volume. And somebody is just going to be very sad when they look at their Cleveland Brown that they start that week. There's just going to be a lot of sad fantasy owners because whether it's Landry or Gordon or Chubb or Duke Johnson, like, Every like there's gonna be weeks where one of those guys is just does absolutely nothing, or just the Browns offense just doesn't you know take that next step and just doesn't score and doesn't move the ball, then it's like well I guess we were all wrong, <laughs> I guess they can't all finish in the top twenty four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're um, right. So that's my one concern um, with that, but you know. I do like, you know, you can I can definitely buy into Tyrod Taylor, you know, targets the tight end, you know, targeting Charles Clay a lot, so I can definitely buy that for sure. Um, my breakout tight end is George Kittle. So, I, you know, re- referenced it a little bit earlier on, um, but I like that he is that big, big red zone weapon for Garoppolo. He has that opportunity. He has a big opportunity with Garoppolo. George Kittle is a guy you can get later in drafts as well. I mean, he's going essentially in the, you know, where is he going? It's tight end 13. So he's going right at the end of the tight end, top 12 tight ends. And he he wasn't great last year. He had a couple games where he was pretty good. I I mean, he's definitely being hyped up, um, you know, with Garoppolo a little bit. But I do think that he does have that potential to break out. Um, With Garoppolo, Garoppolo does have to throw – will throw a touchdown to somebody – and George Kittle could definitely be that main guy um, that could be there for him on the 49ers. So I'm I'm a Kittle fan. Uh, I think that this could be the year he breaks out. And if it's not this year, it could be a little bit you know later down the line. You know we see these young tight ends sometimes they just don't necessarily like it. Just takes them a little bit longer to, to finally you know hit the spot there. Um, so I know Jimmy G was your um, your bust. Dean, but what do you think about Kittle? Um, I like Kittle. Like you said, uh, Garoppolo's got to find a target, and he's going to be a big target uh, down in the red zone for him. I I think he's his second year. uh, It usually takes tight ends two, maybe three years to get to get their feet really planted in the NFL for whatever reason. I think Kittle's a good a good choice there. And this leads us to your next 
guy here. So your sleepers who, which I really like. Um, or actually, no, we'll do busts first. So your busts, and I'm going to argue against you on this one when I get my chance. So you have Trey Burton and Jimmy Graham. So start with Jimmy Graham and then get into Trey Burton, and then I will defend Trey Burton. Okay, Jimmy Graham, Aaron Rodgers has uh, had a great rapport with uh, Jordy Nelson, not with his tight end. Everybody expects Jimmy Graham to come in and just be that guy and, and be the red zone target. I don't know if that's true. I think that Rodgers will do what Rodgers has always done, which is look for his biggest wide receiver uh, down in the red zone. I think that might make Jimmy Graham uh, – well, I think it might make him touchdown dependent, which I know that's kind of – I just said he's not going to see so many touchdowns because of uh, the red zone work with, that Roger, nor, Rogers normally does. But but I don't think uh, he's going to have the type of year or be targeted like people think that he will be. Yeah, no, I agree. He's definitely going to be touchdown dependent, like definitely touchdown dependent. He doesn't have that same speed that we saw in when he was, you know, insane in New Orleans, essentially when he was a crazy, putting up crazy numbers um, as part with the Saints. So he's definitely going to be in the red zone. And I'm not so sure that, because, I mean, think about it. Even one, you know, one one reception for a touchdown, you know, one catch for one yard for, for six, is, what, that's seven points. Mm-hmm. That's not great. So even if he is catching touchdowns, there's a chance that he still will underperform. So um, yeah, I I I think Graham is good. It, it sucks because you where you draft him, you because based on where you draft him, you draft him as a top five tight end. It's hard for you not to start him every week. So if you right. draft him, you're probably going to start him every week, and you're going to get weeks where he does absolutely nothing. So. That's going to be something you live with because you can't take the risk of benching him, and that's the week that he scores three touchdowns. So it's definitely with Graham, you have to know what you're getting into, what you're signing up for, and you're going to have to live with the zero-yard games. You're going to have to live with the, the three touchdown games. So it's a very volatile, and that's the thing with touchdowns. It's very, like, they come and go, and it's not something you can rely on, whereas yardage, you know, like, basically – that's the big thing from Graham from the top four, you know, consensus tight ends, Gronkowski, Kelsey, Ertz, Olsen. Those are all guys that, like, get yardage. They get yardage and then they score touchdowns as well. But even Travis Kelsey, he, he's never really been that big of a touchdown guy. Um, that obviously could change with Mahomes, but he's good because of his yardage. Yeah, I, I think people are forgetting also the – the defenses that they'll see in Green Bay, they were the second toughest schedule against quarterbacks. Not that Aaron Rodgers can't overcome that, because if there's anybody that can, it would be him. But they're the fifth hardest schedule, as far as fantasy points are concerned, against tight ends. I mean, he, we'll, we'll see some defense uh, this year. That's not that it, I don't think he's a good tight end, because he, he is. But like you said, that ADP had been drafted in the top five or six, it makes it hard. You drive yourself nuts trying to figure out when to start him and when not to start him. Yeah. And so, all right, lay it on Trey Burton. Let's see. Let's hear it. Why is he going to bust? I like Trey Burton. Well, a big part of Trey Burton, uh, I think, is his quarterback, which is Mitchell Trubisky. Now, I don't know if Trubisky plays as well as people think. I don't think Trubisky, even if he plays as well as he possibly can, is Carson Wentz. I think that um, 31 targets is what uh, Burton saw last year from Wentz and Foles. Now, he made a lot of use out of those targets. He did really well. And I think he's a talented guy. I don't know if the Bears are going to use him. Um in certain situations, because he's only 235. He's he's never had that full season of, okay, you're the guy, Mr. Burton. You're our tight end. Uh, go 
go make us proud kind of thing. I think he can grow into that, uh, but I'm not sure he's ready for that role just yet. Yeah, I can definitely buy. I can buy that. Um, but for me, I I like the situation. Um, they went out and paid to get him there. Um, you know, like you had said before, you know, young quarterbacks relying on their tight ends. And I, for me, I think that I mean I like the way that they could use him with the coach. Um, Matt Nagy has obviously you know worked with an offense that features the tight end. They've talked about using Trey Burton in a Travis Kelsey role, and that's something I definitely want to buy into, you know, based on how well Travis Kelsey has been. And Trey Burton has always been a very certified tight end. Um, he's always been very good, but he's always just been behind the Zach Ertz. Um, so he's never really had the opportunity right. to shine, and when he did shine in limited time, he did perform. So, yes, he hasn't been the guy, but in times that he has, given the opportunities, he's done really, really well. And, I mean, he threw a touchdown in the Super Bowl. So, like, obviously that's perfect for the Bears' offense. Mitchell Trubisky catching touchdowns from Trey Burton. So, um, and I think that at his price, I think I'm still going to buy into him. I mean, he's going as a tight end 10. And I think after him is where it gets pretty murky. Um, I mean, you got like Burton and then it goes, you know, I'm looking at ADP. So Burton, Doyle, Howard, Kittle, Eifert, Njoku, Brait, Safarian Jenkins, Clay, Cook, you know, so on and so forth. So, I mean, I have no problem taking Burton with that 10 tight end and then taking another one of these other guys kind of later on as, as a two tight end. I'm not like, I mean, I wouldn't say Burton is, you know, I think Burton could become like an every week starter, you know, depending how it all shapes out. But I think that, you know, just making sure you get another Titan as well to go with him. Um, but that's that's me. I'm going to probably go after Trey Burton. So I'm assuming if it's between Burton and Njoku, you, you'd go to Njoku. Yes, I would. Okay. I'd go Burton there for me. Um, so moving okay. here, we can go to the uh, other bust for me um, is Evan Ingram. And this one's pretty easy. This is the another con, kind of a consensus of the industry, just his volume. Um, the volume is not going to be there for him. And, and I was thinking about this, actually. You know, the one argument that could be made for Evan Ingram to not bust is his efficiency could go up. That's totally possible. He, I mean, if he's just a better tight end, if he catches more passes, he catches more touchdowns, he breaks more tackles, like then, yeah, he could definitely, you know, outperform based on last year, you know, without necessarily the same targets, but that's more of a kind of an optimistic look at it. You know, I think that'll happen, but like based on the offensive weapons that are back in New York and that they have Saquon Barkley, they have a running game that they're going to try to do. And you know who can't run block? Evan Ingram. So I could see (laughs) Evan Ingram – not necessarily be on the field if they're running the ball and two, they line up in two wide receiver sets with a tight end. I can guarantee it won't be Evan Ingram <laughs> that that will be blocking. Um, so he could lose some time in the field of play um, if they're running the ball more. And he's just going to see, I mean, Odell Beckham is going to, you know, he's going to be the guy that generates most targets. And I don't think, and there's a chance that Shepard could even have more targets than Ingram too. So, I just don't like the the volume there for Ingram. And though his efficiency could increase, which would be good, right now he's going as a tight end six. I don't – I think he's going to – I think he's more often going to disappoint you. Yeah, Ingram was the third guy. I was trying to decide between Burton and Ingram as a bust. And um, as you said, I think with Barkley there, with Shepard healthy – with uh, Beckham back on the field and healthy, there's there's not as many targets to go around. Um, so six is a little high for him. Uh, actually, I think six is a lot high for Evan Ingram. Not that he's not a talented pass catcher. I think in a place like New Orleans or somewhere like that that really leans on their tight ends a lot, he could be, could be an all-star. But I don't know about the Giants at this time. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, when after, you know, when they signed Des Bryant anyway, that's going to be another guy that they're going to have to, you know, move targets to. So, <laughs> God, Des Bryant. Yeah. I can't even. Um, 
But yeah, so let's look here. The next one here is looking at so sleeper tight ends. So you've got Jared Cook, who I really like as well as a sleeper, and then Jack Doyle. So Jack, so you're not so not worried about Ebron? Is that with, with the Jack Doyle pick? There, there should be an Eric Ebron, you know, twelve step program. I think because every year <laughs> he comes out and he's so talented and he's going to do uh, such great things for his team. And then every year he shows just enough flash of that 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 people still buy in the next year. But I'm uh, no, I'm not getting on the Ebron train. Um, I think Jack Doyle's. Even going at 10 or 11th, I think he's kind of underrated. I think he could be a top five guy if Andrew Luck comes back. Uh, even last year, uh, he played a lot better. Um, his stats were a lot better than than you would think uh, that they would be. Doyle last year, 80 catches, uh, only four touchdowns, uh, right under 700 yards, but he still, he was the tight end nine last year. He had 80 um, catches. Had 80 catches last year. That is, that is um, surprising to me. I, I did not, I knew he had a good year. I didn't know he had 80 catches. Wow, that, that is a lot. Wow. 108 targets. I mean, eight, almost an 80% catch rate. Um, looks like oh. they, were, they were mostly shorter passes. Uh, but I think there's a lot of upside, and Luck will throw to the tight ends also. He he's uh, made Dwight Allen a star um, before Allen moved he on, and he didn't do anything else now. after that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Two guys that have left Indianapolis and done next to nothing uh, wherever they went. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I did not. Yeah, I was honestly, you know, I'm I was a little down on Jack Doyle, um, but you kind of kind of pushed me the other way with him. Um, and yeah, I know I, I was looking at the Roto World, you know, blurbs today, and Eric, you know, you know who's on the top, Eric Abron. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Doyle had the <laughs> second most catches of any tight end. Only, only Travis Kelsey had more catches last year. Wow. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, that is that is surprising to me. That is a, I like that. That's a, that's a good fact right there. That's that's tweet worthy, Dean. You got to tweet <laughs> that. Yeah, I like it. Um, cool. And then, so Jared Cook, I know he's been getting a little hype too from John Gruden. I think the quote was John Gruden was said, man, I've never seen an athlete like Jared Cook. And then like the thing you think about it, you're like, wait, weren't you like a broadcaster? So like, didn't you have to like look at the players before you would talk about them like an analyst? So besides the point, I like Jared Cook as well as a sleeper. Um, so kind of what's your main reason that you like Cook? I mean, obviously the, the Raiders lost Crabtree. And now Martavis Bryant has the potential to also be exited. So you have Cooper there, you have Nelson, and then it looks like Cook could kind of be that that other option there for Derek Carr. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I think Cook is is going to be one of those three main options uh, with Crabtree leaving. Um, Crabtree had, what, 100-some-odd targets last year that's going to be divvied up. Uh, Cook had 86 targets last year, so they threw him the ball. Uh, last year, um, so I think I think that'll increase. I think uh, John Gruden, not to put too much uh, faith in in stuff you hear out of camp, but John Gruden has been quoted as saying he's impressed with how fast Jared Cook is. Like you're saying that maybe Gruden only watched quarterbacks, you know. Uh, that, that to get really ready for, no, he only watched show. he only watched Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. So it only <laughs> could be. <laughs> But I, I think Jerry Cook will play a big role in that offense. Um, I think they, the way they ran it last year, it, it just didn't work out. It's, it's just they need to do something a little different, and I think that in, will involve the tight end a little more heavily. You know what other team needs to involve the tight end a little bit heavier? The Dallas freaking Cowboys. So my sleeper pick for tight end is Blake Jarwin. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right. Blake Jarwin, tight end. So, right now, they have a couple guys on, on the depth chart. 
Um, obviously, Witten retired. Hannah retired. So those are the two main starters. So they're both gone. Rico gathers 300 pound. Rico gathers is there, and you have Blake Jarwin. So in this, I want to tie in the story I read about Jarwin because I was kind of looking into this. I was like, is there a Cowboys tight end that like has a chance? Like, what's the deal here? So we all remember back to the draft, right? And it looks like the Cowboys are going to take Dallas Goddard. And what happens, oh, the Eagles jump up in front of them, the Eagles take Dallas Goddard. Even though it seems like the Eagles didn't really need a tight end, they have Ertz, but they take him anyway, and everyone's like, oh, well, that was in spite. You know, they were getting after the Cowboys. Um, But actually, so what happened earlier in the season, so Blake Jarwin, the Cowboys were going to cut and then try to sign to their practice squad. However, the Eagles really, really wanted him. So the Cowboys were forced to sign Jarwin to their roster to prevent the Eagles from swiping him away. So in some parallel universe, Blake Jarwin is on the Eagles and Dallas Goddard is on the Cowboys. <laughs> not sure if that's what I would have preferred or not, but I would say that there is a chance. People, listen up, you know, Blake Jarwin, if he becomes a streaming tight end next year, that's all in prediction. I project that Blake Jarwin will become a streamable tight end option in 2018. That doesn't mean he's going to be, you know, top 24 tight end necessarily, but I I guarantee that his name will be like on a waiver wire article you read this year about, you know, tight ends to stream Blake Jarwin. Um, and he does have that like pass catching ability. Um, so I, I would just keep a name out for him. And I just thought the story was pretty interesting and how that kind of laid out. So, um, I wouldn't, that's why he's, he's my ultimate sleeper. He, it's real deep, but you know, that's what we do here on the full press, uh, block talk radio. We go deep. And then my other sleeper was Mike Gusecki. And this is just really based on volume. Um, we saw it last year with Evan Ingram, Evan Ingram got volume as a rookie and was able to produce. So with the dolphins, I'm not exactly thrilled with their receiving core. You got Devontae Parker, basically, Eric Ebron as wide receiver. You've got Danny Amendola, who only Danny Amendola, who only shows up during the playoffs. And heh, this just in: the Dolphins aren't going to make the playoffs. So, yep, there you go. Uh, Kenny Stills, I like I like Kenny Stills, but he's more of a deep threat down the field guy, and has actually never really showed that much chemistry with Ryan Tannehill. Um, and Mike Gesicki is there, and he's a tight end, and the reports out of camp haven't been great, but if he's he's a you know an athletic guy and if he can get targets, I think he could be serviceable. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess. Blake Jarwin's a big guy. He's six five, two fifty. He's a pretty good sized guy. I didn't realize uh, he was that big. And Mike Gusecki, yeah, I think Gusecki's got a lot of talent. I think. Uh, I, w- I wasn't real happy where he landed on the Dolphins just because I don't think it's a great spot to be in um, with Ryan Tannehill because Ryan Tannehill is Ryan Tannehill. Uh, he is what he is. Uh, but I think Gusecki, like you said, will have some volume. He will have an opportunity to make an impact. So I like that pick. All right, cool. So now we're getting into the last section here. So value picks. Um you know, value picks are, are some of my favorite picks. I think we got some good ones here, too. Um, so, Dean, you've gone with your value pick going with Charles Clay. Good old Chucky Clay. Um, so, tell me why you like Charles Clay this year. Well, Charles Clay is a guy that uh, when you throw in the ball, he will catch it. He doesn't drop a lot of passes. And it doesn't matter which of the three quarterbacks in Buffalo play. They're all pretty young. I think, again, it gets back at that's kind of a broken record, but a younger quarterback, even an A.J. McCarron that's been in the league a little bit, I think they'll lean towards Charles Clay. And to be honest, is there any wide receiver off of Buffalo that you're going to draft in, for your fantasy teams? There's there's none. There's no shares of, of Buffalo wide receiver I'm going to have this year. Zay Jones, I think, is probably the most talented, uh, but but I'm not going to I'm not going to draft. Uh, Zay Jones uh, for my targets have to go somewhere. And I think Charles Clay is the guy 
that will get him. Calvin Benjamin, I, Calvin Benjamin's, he's another guy that kind of looks like he ought to be something really special, but he just hasn't ever been anything really special uh, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I think Clay, jo- Clay, uh, Clay Jones, I think Charles Clay is, is the piece of the offense to own in Buffalo if you're going to own the piece. Uh, Dean, this is a great one. So Charles Clay is the clay that makes the offense stick together in Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Charles Clay. And the thing that I think people – I think the reason why he's also really going later in drafts too is because he got hurt last year. So he started out the year really, really well, and then he kind of fizzled off because he got hurt and he came back and he just wasn't as good when he came back. But he's going as a tight end 18 right now. Um, I mean, he's going after guys like Cameron Brait, uh, Austin Safarian Jenkins, uh, Eifert, OJ Howard, Jack Doyle. So he's going after a lot of those guys. Um, so I really like Clay too as a value. Um, I think he's, I think he's very safe. So when we talk about a guy like when we're talking about Jimmy Graham, Jimmy Graham is not safe like at all. Like he is 100% boomer bust. But Charles Clay is like. I feel like he's like solid for at least 50 to 60 yards every week. And then, you know, maybe a touchdown here or there. So I, I definitely like Charles Clay as a guy that's going to collect steady targets and give you consistency week over week. You'll know what you're getting out of him, um, which is what I like to see. My value pick is good old Vernon Davis, tight end. Vernon Davis. Vernon Davis used to be like one of the most elite tight ends in the NFL. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, Dean, in a place on the West Coast, San Francisco, with a quarterback by the name of Smith, the same quarterback that he has now in Washington again. The Alex Smith-Vernon Davis train has reunited and is going to (laughs) inflict pain on defenses all across the league. Because, A, they have that chemistry. B, Vernon Davis is practically the starting tight end because we all know about Jordan Reed. And we all know about Jordan Reed's upside. And we all know about Jordan Reed. If he'd stay healthy, he'd be a top three tight end. But, I mean, I mean, Jordan Reed being injured is about as, you know, likely as the sun coming up the next day. Let's be honest. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, there's, life doesn't guarantee many things. You know, taxes, death, and Jordan Reed being questionable on the injury report. Those are really, you know, the main three things that you kind of have to keep in mind. So I really like Vernon Davis. Um, He's still, you know, despite, I think he's like, I mean, he's up there in age, but he's still been pretty effective. And we've seen tight ends play pretty long. Jason Witten, you know, just retired. Antonio Gates still wants to play. So Vernon Davis, I think, is a guy that you can get super late in your drafts and I think is a must must own if you draft Jordan Reed. Just cover your butt and draft Jordan and, and draft Vernon Davis, and that way Jordan Reed is hurt, which is hurt, will be hurt. Um, you can start a tight end in his place, and, and Vernon Davis has done pretty well um, there. And then to get even deeper before we get into, you know, before we wrap up here, another name, another name to keep in mind, Jeremy Sprinkle. So... Jeremy Sprinkle is a tight end that you definitely want to remember because I think he's a good dynasty ad. Jeremy Sprinkle, for those that don't, what team is, you know what team Jeremy Sprinkle's on, Dan? Uh, I'm going to say Washington. Yep, yeah, he's on the Redskins, where's number 87, 6'5", 252, Arkansas. I'm obviously looking at his Wikipedia page right now. Um, But he's a guy that you might want to keep in mind. Uh, You know, if Vernon Davis goes down, guys like that, Jordan Reed gets hurt again, Jeremy Sprinkle. And just think about it. His name is Sprinkle. How can he not be an amazing fantasy player? Just imagine the fantasy football names, these team names. It'll be great. Um, It'll be great. But – yeah, that basically that wraps up the show for today, everybody. I'm glad you're listening. Um, you know, we're on Blog Talk Radio, full press coverage. 
Um, you know, once again, uh, Dean, want to thank you for hopping on. I know we had a little bit of trouble in the beginning getting everything get, get, getting going, but I think we were able to figure it out and we got the good show together, you know, full, get everything full through. Um, so let's just do another, you can give another shout out and, you know, let the people know where they can find your work. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, bad apple FFB, or you can find me at FPC underscore Titans, um, either place. Awesome, Dean. And, and before we go, you know, that Twitter handle, bad apple, where, where does that come from? <laughs> well, I, I named a whole bunch of uh, my fantasy teams after uh, fruit and vegetables. You know, I had the angry tomatoes and the bad apples and <laughs> the fighting pineapples. And that. it was just a theme I went through uh, a couple of years back. And the bad apples, uh, they won both leagues that I had chosen that name in. So I thought, well, that's a good, that's as good as any. So when I went to Twitter to find more information about fantasy football, that's the handle I came up with. I like it. I love hearing, you know, Twitter handle like origin stories. I just think that they're really cool. Like mine personally, like mine's at Andrew Erickson underscore. So essentially, obviously I wanted to be at Andrew Erickson because that's my name, but somebody already owns that Twitter name. So instead of adding like a number, I added an underscore because I made my Twitter when I was like in eighth grade. And I thought that would be the coolest thing to do was to add an underscore. So it looked like, but realistically it just confuses people because they can't see the underscore. And then they do at Andrew Erickson. And then they're like, wait, why didn't you get my tweet? Why didn't you get my DM? And I'm like, cause you didn't add the underscore. So, but you know, one day Dean, I'm going to find that at Andrew Erickson. I'm going to buy their domain from them that buy that handle from them. Get it. Um, cause right now they're holding it hostage. So, uh, that's it for me. But uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, we'll be back at some point. Um, once again, shout out to Dean for hopping on today's podcast. And uh, we will hear from you guys soon. Later. Thanks for having me, Art. No worries.